Forget about it. Forget about it. Yeah, you know that. Long time. Long time. Welcome to the first of our electives here at the World Debate Institute, uh, 2008 World Universities Debating Workshop. Uh, and you know, there, they had a motion in, at the Worlds this year. This house would assassinate Vladimir Putin. And so there were a hundred debates on this subject. And in only four of them, now the average you would expect the first team to be first 25% of the time, right? But in only four of the debates was a team who was first government ranked as first. Now, there, there, there are some solutions for that. We could have perhaps a more balanced motion that didn't call for an act of war against a, a, a major global power. <laughs> you know, you'd have more balanced motion. Or you could have better tactics and strategies for doing the first government. Here to share her ideas about that with us today is former England national champion, president of the Cambridge Union, uh, and former director of the Center for Speech and Debate uh, at, at the English Speaking Union, and now an international raconteur uh, and educator par excellence. Please welcome Debbie Newman. Very much, Gina. Uh, okay, yeah, what we're going to do in this session is we're going to have a think about um, for when you draw in that position, first, uh, first government, first proposition, opening affirmative, whatever we want to call it, um, how can you try and beat those odds? Um, because there's no doubt that one of the problems with British parliamentary as a format, every, pro every format has its good things and its bad things, but one of the problems with British parliamentary does seem to be that if you look at the statistics, it doesn't work out when you look at those wins, 25% for each four of the positions, um, there is a bias um, against opening government and there's a bias um, towards um, closing opposition. But sometimes you're going to have to speak in that opening government um, position, we want to think about how we can do that um, as effectively as possible. I think that there are four reasons, probably more as well, but I think I can identify to start with four reasons why um, opening government is a hard position to be in. Um, the first one is that you have the least preparation time. If you are the very first speaker in the debate, you literally do only have those 15 minutes to prepare. You know, the first opposition speaker has the 15 minutes plus the seven minutes, so they've got 22 minutes, and, and as it goes on. So you've got the least time to prepare if you're an opening government. Um, the second um, reason um, is that it's generally a little bit harder to be on the affirmative side. So when you look at other formats um, where they just have one team um, on each side, there tends to be a little sway towards, statistically, towards the opposition winning. The proposition has the burden of proof. Um, they have to um, set up arguments and that can be harder um, than uh, breaking them down. They have to prove every part of their case, whereas sometimes an opposition can win just by disproving one large part of that case. Um, so you've got the least time, you've got the harder burden in that sense. Um, thirdly, because of the nature of um, the activity, if you're speaking um, first in the debate, uh, there are three other teams following you, um, it is possible just to get a little bit forgotten about, a little bit shut out, perhaps the debate moved on to other issues, the second half of the table um, decided they wanted to talk about other sorts of things, and your contribution can be a bit forgotten. Um, or seem like it wasn't the most important contribution by the time you get to the end of the debate. Um, and fourthly, um, competition conveners and the people who uh, set the motions um, don't always set good motions. And that's something that we have to, um, have to accept. If motions were always chosen, uh, big issues, big controversial issues that were in the news and we knew a lot about, you know, when we're having debates about um, abortion and the death penalty and big issues, there's not as much of a disadvantage in being open in government. Okay? But what tends to happen uh, is sometimes the university students who are in charge, or the, um, the graduates um, who are in charge of running the competitions have their own pet motions that they want to see. Okay? And they might not be issues that anybody really has ever spent any time thinking about, that anybody in the real world like, actually thinks are, are a good idea, that you haven't had the chance to read newspaper articles about because you, know, you don't just uh, pick up the daily news and find a, an editorial arguing about why we should assassinate Putin, to use the example that we heard there. Um, so sometimes what you get is these uh, uh, motions, which just really the convener thinks, oh, isn't that interesting? Nobody's ever debated that before. Um, I'll be seen as being original and interesting um, if I set this really odd topic. Um, and if there is a topic like that that's set, obviously the first proposition team 
are in the hardest position. Um, firstly, because if nobody in the real world really thinks that they, it should be done and it isn't talked about, the chances are it's not a very good idea. Um, but also, secondly, um, if you haven't had any time to think about it, it's not an issue that's out there, um, you, that preparation time becomes even shorter. And the other three teams in the debate have an advantage there because even if they've never thought about that issue before, they can be responsive. Okay, whereas you've actually just got to sit down and go, right, from nowhere, how do I come up with, um, with the arguments to, um, to attack this? So there's no doubt that it's a hard position to be in. The thing to remember in some ways, the thing that's good about British parliamentary debating, uh, is you can win the world championships by only winning one debate, okay, which is the final. You can come second in every other debate and still be a world champion. If you come second in every preliminary round, um, as long as the kind of tab is running according to normal principles, you're going to break to the octo finals and through the octos, quarters and semis, two teams are always going to progress. So you only actually need to win one debate. And that's the same um, at other tournaments, not just world, BP run tournaments. Um, and it's not as hard to come second from opening government as it is um, to come first in the world. <coughs> so sometimes I think we kind of have to say, although I've called this how to win from opening government, I think potentially it's how to come first or second um, from opening government in that sense. And the reason why I kind of make that caveat is because the position it's hardest to beat from first proposition, the position you have the least control over, is the second opposition team. You have some control over the dynamic between who wins between you and the first opposition team, okay? Because your second speaker is gonna get to do a rebuttal to their opening speaker, and they can do them a lot of damage, and they can, um, can, win the, can beat the first opposition team in that way. Um, equally, by running a case in a particular way, and um, we'll have a look at different ways you can do this, you could wrong foot your first opposition team a little bit, uh, weaken their position, and beat your first opposition team that way. Uh, there are ways to think about how, as first proposition, you could beat your second proposition team. Okay, there are strategic decisions you can make about ways you want to take the debate, uh, which you think will make it harder for your second proposition team um, to find good areas to extend to. It's not quite as easy as beating your first opposition team. It's hard to beat a team that's, um, that's going to follow you and try to support you in that way. But there are things you can think about to do that. You have basically no control over whether or not you win, beat your second opposition team. That's something that, that just seems to be the way of, of uh, British parliamentary debating. Um, if that team is as good as you in second opposition, you've got to think the chances are they're going to beat you. Because they've had half an hour to think about what you're going to say, what you've said, um, to destroy it, and you have absolutely no recourse to come back at them. Okay, you're completely hopeful that your proposition summary speaker, that the proposition whip, is good enough to try and defend the case that you've put out. You can try three points of information, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but your second opposition team might not want to take your points of information. Okay, so that's the one you've got the, the least control over um, in that sense. But even there, we can try and convince judges we can, because the nature of judging in BP could be that even if that second opposition team do manage to beat your arguments, a judging panel could still sit back and say, but in terms of where they were in the debate, in terms of fulfilling their role on the table, the position they were in, who did a better job? So did the first proposition team do the best possible job they could do from, from here? And maybe even if second opposition did manage half an hour later to come up with some killer rebuttals, um, perhaps they also... Uh, you know, it didn't do the most comprehensive summary speech, or there might be ways in which they didn't best fulfill their position on the table, so you could still win the debate. So you still have to kind of go and try and win that debate in that sense. Did you have a, a question? Yes, I had a quick question. Um, we've had a, um, an issue, at least I have, this, this, during this week, that we get off topic from the original, like the first gov will go up and they'll, they'll read the motion, then the, the first opposition goes up and say, and it gets kind of away from the actual thing. Can like let's say for your um your um the second government opposition, can you go back and try to focus it back into the question if it gets derailed before it um, gets to you? Yes and no, depending on on, um, on exactly what you mean there. And I'll try and explain this by coming to I've gone through these all of these disadvantages of being the, the opening government team um, that we have. Of course, the opening government team does have one big advantage that you that you do have control over, which is that you get to define. And in that sense, you get to set the terms of the debate. Now, there are um, uh, rules within which you can do that. We talked this morning about squirreling. Um, 
your, your definition should be an interpretation of the motion uh, that's a fair interpretation of the motion. Um, and you know, if, a, if there was a large audience coming to watch this debate, they should be able to look at the order paper and look at the motion and have a pretty good sense of what the debate is that they're about to see. Okay? So if, uh, you know, my, my debate this morning, the motion said um, that we would pay obese people um, to lose weight, we should be talking about paying obese people to lose weight. And the debate that I ended up seeing was actually, oh no, we'll pay for them to lose weight, we'll pay for their gym, etc. And clearly that's not actually the, you know, the, the motion as is, and that's not necessarily a fair definition. But within that case of actually going for a fair definition, the first proposition team get to choose how they're going to interpret those terms, where they're going to put the lines, so you know, where is this motion going to um, be, when's it going to happen, who's it going to involve, and they get to put out that plan in that sense. And that could be, although, as I say, it can't be an unfair interpretation of the motion, it could be a sort of a narrowing of, it doesn't have to be, this is true in every case, everywhere in the world, for all time. Um, they, they can set the terms um, and the limits from which they want to have that debate. So that's their advantage. And the rest of the three teams in the debate, including the second proposition team, do then have to make the arguments under that definition. So at that point, at the point where the definition is on the table, the motion that was written on the order paper becomes obsolete. Okay, so there's no sense of topicality arguments from the opposition in that sense, and there's no sense that the second proposition team can in some way say, well, we're not going to talk about their definition, we're going to go back to the motion. Um, so the definition has to be what's argued. So the second proposition team can't change the definition, and they shouldn't really um, add to it either, though, although in some cases there may be, uh, they might sort of add a, a, a regulatory um, system or something that might go with it. But in, a, in an ideal world, the propos first proposition is going to put all of that stuff down on the table so the whole rest of the debate can become the practical and principled reasons why we should or shouldn't do the plan that the first proposition team laid out. Now, having said that, in terms of the arguments, if you think the way that the debate has gone in terms of those principled and practical clashes um, is going in a way um, that you don't think is um, a way that you like on the first half of the table, absolutely you can steer that in a different direction on the second half of the table. In fact, that's often what extensions are. Okay, so what I was thinking is like, let's say you have a proposition, we should drain the lake. And the first gov talks about the lake. Can the second gov come in and give the name to a lake? Because if everybody's talking about a broad sense, even from, from this, like, okay, we're going to go drain the lake. Nobody knows what lake we're arguing over. We're just arguing over the environmental whatever. Can we come in and say, well, you know, I, I, I think we should drain the lake. I think it should be Lake Saskatchewan. Okay. Can um, you do that? I mean, that's, that's bringing into the question the idea of open motions, um, which I'm not sure about nationally in America, but in, um, in Europe, and at work, you'd never see an open motion like that at Worlds anymore. I mean, it'd be very rare to see it at a domestic um, European championship as well. I'm not sure if you do get these motions at um, uh, in American BP tournaments, which are really open, where the first proposition gets to choose a case um, from within a very broad um, motion in that sense. Um, generally, if, if you are in a, an open motion like that, then the first proposition does get to choose. So they get to choose which lake in that kind of sense. Um, and if they choose that lake, then there's certainly no way that anybody else can talk about any other lake in that sense. If they don't, if they choose not to, if they're, say, say you follow a novice team that doesn't realize that they're supposed to run a case, and they think they really generally have to, say the motion is um, uh, that, um, that uh, we should never cry or something, and they do spend their 14 minutes talking about um, you know, tears and um, the good and bad things about expressing emotion or something, then it would be possible from the second proposition to say, we've talked about the principal issues around this general idea and now what we're going to do is narrow it down in the second half of the table to look at this specific issue. Um, but from the point of view of what we're, what we're really thinking about today in terms of the, the opening government, of course one of the things to say about how um, you, you get a win from an opening government is about that sense of how you set up the debate. So you would never be in a position where your second proposition team could do that to you, where your second proposition team um, could, um, could essentially have to, um, to create a debate from the second half of the table, because you're going to make sure that you create a really excellent debate from the start. Okay? And that's the first, um, first thing we're going to look at. But yeah, question. Um, I read through the packet we got on the first day. I'm just wondering um, how does challenging the definition fit into, or is that just... In reality... BP isn't a format that has definition challenging. Okay. Um, it sometimes has definition whinging. Um, so a first opposition team might point out 
uh, that, a, uh, that a proposition team had, uh, had, had squirreled the motion and might whinge about that just to make sure that everyone knows that they've tried to take an advantage over everyone. They've stolen that 15 minutes preparation time that we've all had. Um, that we were all in good faith preparing for, but they've even been too cowardly to run what was um, the case, or whatever it was in that sense. So you might get a whinge in that sense to try and get some sympathy and make sure that the, uh, the judges um, sort of have picked it up, um, but then the tradition is that you then debate it. So for example, in the debate this morning, when the proposition kind of um, changed what it meant to pay obese people and sort of pay for obese people instead, um, the, the, whole, the whole debate then is still on how they've defined. The only real exceptions to that, the only times where you might challenge a definition from a first opposition are if they have literally run something which is undebatable. So if they've run a truistic case um, in that sense. Um, or possibly in the case of an open motion where this question was here, if they have put no definition on the table at all, in an example like, um, you know, this house would rather be the tortoise than the hare, and they've just talked about tortoises and hares and which ones it's better to be, then the first opposition speaker is the first person that gets the chance to say, well, that's all very interesting, but let's look about that in the case of what we should do with a rug. Okay, so the first opposition speaker has, has that opportunity to, to do that there. But pretty much, as long as the first proposition speaker has done a definition and it's a debatable definition, that's what the next hour or so and the next eight speeches are going to be on in that sense. But again, I don't want us to think so much today about like, what we can do uh, from other positions when we're hit with a bad first proposition team. I want us to think about how we can make sure that we're not that bad first proposition team um, and that we're, um, you know, we're, we're, we set up a really good, strong debate in that sense. And the first thing to think about definitely is the choices you're going to have to make about that definition when you see the motion. Okay? That's the, the first thing you're going to be judged on. They're going to sit there in the judging room and they have their discussions and they're going to say, well, but, you know, did they set up a good debate? Did they set up a clear debate where all the arguments were able to you know, continue from this good framework um, that, that we came down on? So the first thing that you have to make sure of your definition is that your definition is clear and considered. Now, by definition, I'm including both the sort of interpretation of the wording in that sense, but also if it's a policy debate, the plan that you put down. All right, including that as part of the definition, part of your setup for the debate. So what that means is, have you, in terms of the clarity, have you thought about, asked and answered all the questions that need to be asked and answered? So for example, if you've been given a motion about um, uh, legalizing cannabis, there are some questions that need to be cleared up for the rest of the debate to happen. Um, it's a sort of different debate, in a way, uh, if you um, want to legalise licensed cafes um, to be able to um, sell cannabis in a particularly uh, regulated environment on the one hand, um, or if you want to legalise people to be able to smoke, um, to be able to buy marijuana in shops, grow it themselves, smoke it publicly wherever they want to. I mean, those are two, they're, they're both valid models, I'm not in any way saying that, uh, that they're not debatable things, but the arguments that the opposition might want to run are clearly different arguments depending on what you've run. And what it's not fair to do is to just stand up and say, yeah, we're just going to legalise marijuana. And then when the first opposition team starts to talk about some of the uh, social issues on the streets, you can't come back in second and say, oh, well, of course, we just mean in licensed cafes where they'll all be behind closed doors in one area of the city. Okay? Because what you can't do is add to a definition later on as a way of trying to come back against arguments that have been made. So you have to make sure that your definition is there from the start so that there's that clear framework of the arguments to be made. Um, in the same sort of way, um, you know, legalizing prostitution. Two models, are you, are you legalizing brothels um, in, in one sort of red light um, district area where you're gonna have um, uh, safe sex um, compulsory and tests and um, people have to be over a certain age and all this kind of stuff, a really regulated system. Or is what you're really saying is that you believe if you know, any individuals can enter into contracts between each other to have sex and you don't think that the law will come into that in that sense. Again, really different debates that you're setting up. The arguments, the principled arguments become different depending on, on what you put forward. Electing judges. Okay, which, um, which judges are you electing? How often are you going to elect them for? Um, do you have to have certain minimum criteria to be able to stand for the um, elections? It, you know, is it a life position or, uh, or, or re-elections in that sense? They're different arguments. Okay? So you do need to 
um, to make sure that you've asked yourself those definition questions. The who is it, the who, which is both who's gonna do it and who's it gonna apply to and who's gonna be limited from it. The where, is this a national thing? Is it an international thing? Um, is it a state thing? Okay, in that sense. The when, is this something you can just click your fingers and do or is this something that needs to be done over a time scale in some way? Um, and the how. Um, you know, how's it going to be done? How's it going to be funded? Um, how will it work? Um, any of those kind of details in that sense. So those questions need um, need to be asked and answered at the beginning of the debate, so that it's sent out really clearly. Okay. Now, those things aren't fundamentally designed to try and shut out opposition arguments. They're fundamentally designed to try and set up a clear debate. So when you're making your decisions about your plan. It shouldn't necessarily be that every time you come up with an opposition argument that they might run, you try and add a part to your plan that will in some way anticipate and shut out their arguments. Because by doing that, you almost always set, you come across a, a different opposition argument instead. It should really be about, in the real world, what kind of, you know, how would this be done? What kind of things do we need um, to, to make it make sense in that way? When you deliver that definition at the beginning of your first proposition speech, you have to go slowly and clearly. Okay? It's important that the other side, who are listening in good faith, get the chance to hear what you're saying and get to know all of those different bits of your definition. And it's important that the judges write it down. Because if the opposition miss something and they start saying, oh, you know, you said that everyone's going to get forced to do that and you're standing up on a point of information and saying, no, we never said that, we said it was going to be voluntary, well, all you're relying on really is either the judge's memory or the judge's notes as to who's right, as to whether or not you did say that or not. So make sure you take some time at the beginning with this clear and considered definition and plan um, to make sure that nobody's in any doubt about what it is that's being debated. So you, you would hope that at the end of your de definition, nobody's going to talk about the definition again for the whole rest of the debate. It will just be remembered. It will just stand there as this thing which set up, this beacon which set up and allowed us to have this good debate in that way. But I don't think it's enough just to be clear and considered um, with your definition. You do also have, um, often have some strategic decisions to make about your definition as well. And normally, the strategic decision that you have is whether or not you go big and broad and bold, or whether or not you go uh, quite narrow and cautious and... Um, yeah, I'm sort of centred in, in that sense, okay? So sometimes our temptation is, so for example, in that um, example about prostitution, you might say that the bigger, broader, bolder thing to do is to say, government shouldn't have anything to do with this, individuals, people, companies, whatever they want to do, and this will be just like um, anything else that we sell, any other commodity. We might have certain sort of regulations over it, like we do over other um, commodities, but essentially we're just going to legalise it, everyone can do it. Or that kind of much tighter system of saying, I've got a really kind of tight idea I want to put forward here of these brothels with these, you know, nine different things that have to apply before it can happen. Now, yeah, go on. Uh, sorry, I, you might say, you might, I'm kind of anticipating what you're about to say. Um, what, are, what are the advantages of going big and bold whenever, uh, like, you're just making it harder for yourself? Correct. I'm not sure that you do make it harder for yourself when you go big and bold. Because there's two, there's decisions that you want to make. It depends whether or not you're really wanting to centre your debate on practicalities or if you're wanting to centre your debate on principles. If you want to centre your debate on principles, you're almost always better to go bold. If you really, if your main reason for why you want to legalise prostitution is because you think that people have a right to do what they want with their body, consenting adults should be allowed to choose this, it's out of step with the morality of what we have, it, it, it should be absolutely fine within our society for sex to be a commodity, then you should be running with that big, bold definition that says, yeah, all right, if that's my principle, I'm going to stand by that. Okay, and I'm not going to say, well, people have to wear condoms and they have to have these checks um, and they have to do it in this room on this street because those things don't really stand by my principle, that big principle. Okay, if you really believe in the principle, be bold with the plan. If, on the other hand, you were approaching that debate wanting to say, well, look, we, we've, we just think that prostitution is something that we don't really like. We don't think it's necessarily a very desirable thing in society. But we do think it exists, and we don't think we're going to be able to get rid of it. And 
and we want a system which is within that safer for the people involved with it, then obviously that's going to want to lend you towards um, the, the more practical, um, tighter definition in that sense. Okay, so you're always going to have those um, those choices um, ahead of you in that sense. Not in every case, by any means. Okay, there's no there's no sort of one rule that um, that, that says that you'll always win every debate by doing this. But I think, on the whole, that a first proposition is in a stronger position if they go principled and they go big and bold. Okay. Now, I'm sure that, as I say, there, there might be people that, um, that, that disagree with that, um, and there's certainly kind of arguments on different senses. But I think in terms of actually kind of putting your stamp on a debate and really setting up big clashes, saying, you know, I, I wasn't scared, I went out there, I was bold, um, and I came up with the arguments to support my bold proposition, setting up a really big debate with big principled clashes in it, I think that that's a good way of, of stamping your presence on the debate and getting credit from the judges, okay, in that sense. So, for example, um, if in the prostitution debate, um, if you put forward arguments about the, the, uh, from first proposition about um, the safety um, or, of um, prostitutes and clients, and sort of put forward in that way, um, and then the first opposition team, um, you know, try to put arguments forward about how this won't actually work and how we'll still have a black market um, and your benefits won't um, actually accrue in that sense. Um, it, I think it's easier for them to beat you on those grounds than if you stand up and say, you know, they have to justify now to us why um, when we've modified almost everything else to do with sex, with pornography and stripping and a promiscuous society and, and all the rest, they have to tell us why this is still immoral. Um, because really we think this is about individual choice, it's about freedom, the government doesn't have a place here. And I think that it's harder for the opposition to knock down your arguments on that. They can put forward the alternative argument and you can end up with a big clash debate in that sense, but it's hard for them to actually disprove your big principle stance in this sense. So on the debate that we saw about selling organs, you can argue about whether or not this is or isn't the most effective way of solving a solution with um, an organ crisis. You can argue about the black market and whether or not it will increase it or decrease it. But there's something different about those arguments and the arguments that say, look, it's my body. Why shouldn't I be able to make a rational choice to assess the risks about how much I need my kidney and what the risks are? And to put that against um, the rational desire to have more money in my life, potentially because I need it, um, why do I need the government to make that decision for me? Why am I unable to make that decision for myself? And to run a sort of libertarian principle on those grounds. Um, those arguments almost always stay in the debate all the way through. They always go back and forth. The summary speakers will still be talking about them at the end of the debate. It's very rare that they'll get lost. So Tuna and I actually were first government for that legalized selling organs, and I was just thinking about that as well. And uh, so you think, like, like we, we narrowed it a lot. We, made, we said you can only sell it to the government for a specific amount, like non-bodily organs, non-important organs, et cetera. Um, so you think that if we had left it broad, we would have, we would have been, it would have been possible for us to win this specific debate? Um, I think that there may have been more of a chance that kind of your issues that you said from the beginning of this debate, this is what this debate is about, or what the whole debate ended up being about, okay? Because by establishing a problem and establishing that your solution kind of hits the problem in that sense, um, it's, it's really possible that your opposition might kind of say, well, okay, um, you know, we agree with the problem, um, you know, maybe your solution will work, maybe it won't kind of work in that sense, but we're now gonna go more on principle, okay? And we're gonna kind of take, we're gonna sort of establish a sort of moral principle in the debate in that sense, which over, um, overrules in that way. And there just seems to be something about sort of principles. If the main reason you're doing something is, is a principle, um, it, it just seems to, to, to always stay in the debate in that sense. So yeah, um, perhaps the, you know, the arguments that, um, that you wanted to put forward as almost being additional justifications of the individual choice over their own body, if that becomes the prime justification that, that what we want to do is, is get the government out of um, issues to do with, with our own um, body. I think that can set up a bigger debate in that sense. 
But as I say, it's not certainly not true in in every case. I don't think you always want to rush to the to the extreme. You don't always want to be there being the most right wing Republican or like you know the most socialist you can be or the most libertarian or, or um, in in that sense. But it always it's always worth thinking about it at least and not getting into the mindset that you, what your 15 minutes is for is to find the easiest possible way for you to convince the most possible people because you've gone as close to you can as the center ground and you've tried to get rid of every possible thing that they could say and you've ended up running this kind of really little thing in that kind of sense. Um, at least sit and think about, well, wait a minute, how would it work if we ran it in this big way in that sense and think about the kind of bold, uh, bold way of putting it uh, forward. You will almost always get um, get credit um, from the judges for, for doing it. Okay, in, in that sense, you of course put sensible put sensible um, regulations around your definitions if you need to. Um, clearly, if we you know if we're arguing something like legalizing euthanasia, we want to know that there's good regulations in place um, to stop it being abused. Absolutely, don't feel that you, you can't. I'm not saying don't put any regulations on things, but in terms of the heart of what you're approaching. Um, always consider that kind of broad principle approach. Um, the, the next thing that can really help um, put your stamp on a debate and make sure that you're remembered. So you've got first of all that question you've got, um, you know, oh, did they set up a good debate? Um, did we have a clear debate? Or was the definition really murky? Did the judges come out at the end saying, well, we still weren't really sure if this was about this or this. So we've ticked that box. We're going to be absolutely crystal clear with our definition. Um, did you set up a good debate um, in terms of, did you leave it at least big enough, even if you haven't decided to go really big, did you leave it big enough that the judges like, have seen a good debate with good clash in it all the way through um, on some big issues in that sense, going to get credit for that? Um, have your arguments stayed in the debate um, all the way through? It's something you hear judges say a lot. Uh, yeah, you know, we're giving the first in this debate to the first opposition team because we really think they introduced the arguments that stayed in the debate all the way through. Okay, so that's clearly if that's the sort of thing judges say in feedback, that's something that you're aiming for, that it's your arguments that stay in the debate all the way through. And I say that you've got uh, six other people in the room, so you can't guarantee uh, that this can happen. But two ways you can do that. Firstly, though, what we're talking about saying that often it's principles that stay in the debate. But in whatever type of argument you're doing, you can try and make your arguments stay in the debate by the way that you label your arguments. Okay, this is the next thing I want to talk about. It's really powerful in terms of stamping your presence in a debate if you know the third opposition speaker is still using your language as the debate goes on. Mm -hmm. Okay? And what that means is as you try and set up the debate, you want memorable labels for your arguments and for your approaches. So that what happens is, is that the, you know, the opposition team say, well, they said this, and pick up your memorable phrase. And then the second opposition team will say, well, they tried to attack this. Okay? And your memorable phrases and your memorable labels um, are working um, on the debate as it goes through um, in that sense. So you're not forgotten. You've somehow kind of subtly managed to make the other speakers remind the judges of you for you. It won't always work. Some speakers will always automatically reject your labels and put their own on for those exact kind of reasons because they want to be establishing their own language and their own linguistic control over the debate. But I can guarantee you, if you have really rubbish, long, naff, forgettable names for your arguments, then they're certainly not going to use them. So your best chance is to try and actually think um, about the, um, uh, the arguments that you're using. Um, an example um, of this um, that I take from a world schools debate actually, uh, where a speaker set out his points um, and he talked about the fact that he was going to talk within a debate um, about the fat cats and the drowning kittens. Okay, as labels for his arguments. One was going to be a label about how this kind of affected the big corporates, the other one was going to be the people who got. Um, you know, the small people who, who ended up sort of, you know, starving um, as a result of it in this kind of sense. Now, those were really strong, memorable images, and the whole rest of the debate, people said, well, let's have a look at these fat cats, then, in this sense, and using his language to come back at him in those ways. Now, you've only got 15 minutes to prepare for a debate. You've got to come up with your arguments. You've got to structure them well. You've got to put them in. I'm not saying spend all of your 15 minutes um, uh, trying to come up with the catchiest possible labels, but often just spending a little bit of time thinking about your identity, your linguistic identity, and having short, sharp, snappy, 
um, headings for, for points can be a really effective way of keeping your, um, your arguments in the debate and your identity in the debate in that sense. The next thing, which is um, similar in a way in terms of it's about thinking about that sense of how can you make sure that the debate carries on on your terms in that way, um, so that it's not that you've had this little contribution at the beginning and then other people have you know, wrestled terms um, in that sense, is to think about your arguments as you're putting them forward and as you're setting your case up, um, not as a list of arguments, but as steps that you're going through to prove the debate. Um, so to illustrate this, sometimes what happens, particularly again in BP when you've got very short preparation time, is you brainstorm your arguments um, in preparation and then you just decide quickly, well, which one's most important somehow? All right, okay, well, this is one, two, three, okay, so that's number three, so you have that one as second speaker. Um, and they might come from all sorts of places and, um, and you know, you might say number one might be um, uh, you know, they are evil, number two, you're thinking about kind of um, from the Beijing um, debate we did yesterday, um, they're evil, um, uh, this would cause xenophobia, and then my partner's going to look at um, the economic effects or something, I'm not sure. So you, you've come up with these different points, and you've basically just put them into a list. Okay, it's like a shopping list of arguments. They've all got a name, um, you've hopefully at least got as far as choosing to prioritise them in terms of um, some kind of order of importance. But essentially, they're, they're just arguments that you're throwing out here. I want you to vote for my side of the motion, and I've come up with three, four, five reasons why you should in that way. And that's not, that's not bad debating. And that's certainly, I think, how we all start off learning how to debate. Come up with a list of arguments and brainstorming, divide them between you, name them, put, in, put them into your speeches. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But there is a way, I think, of taking that to the next level which is to think instead, in terms of thinking like, I have all of these reasons, um, and they're gonna have all of these reasons, and then audience, your decision at the end is gonna be to weigh their reasons against our reasons and decide which ones um, you find more convincing. Is instead to try and look at the debate in terms of that sense of, I'm standing here to propose this to you today, what do I think I have to prove in order to get you to vote for me today? Okay? So not just like, what are my reasons, and maybe one of my reasons is really important and another one, um, maybe that's kind of less important in that sense. But really that sense of having identified, in order to get the country to vote for me or the room to vote for me, what do I have to have proved? And those normally come down to the same sorts of questions. And then the sorts of questions that we often see in a whip speech, when people have had an hour to think about it, and they've really boiled down to the debate to what it's all about, but don't so often come up at the beginning of the debate and actually form the structure of the case. But really, if that's what the debate's all about by the end of the debate, then you're in an advantage if you can have identified that at the start and set the debate up on your terms from the start. So the kinds of things I'm thinking about that you can ask yourself, and you can name your points these if you want, although remember to have your um, quirky labels as well, but things like to prove that we should do something. You might have to prove, might have to answer the question, is it necessary? Okay. Um, is this the Newman? The Newman, the Newman hierarchy? No, that's in my rebuttal. That's in my rebuttal one. Although I suppose it comes from the same kind of idea of trying to make sure that you're prioritizing the heart of a case. Okay, because um, uh, you know, for example, in we're talking about debate on prostitution, and um, maybe you've got an argument in the debate about prostitution that we'd like the tax money from prostitution rather than it going to criminals. But you have to ask yourself: if there was nothing else, would that actually be a reason for legalising prostitution? Should we legalise prostitution? Um, yes, we'll get the tax. Probably not. Okay, it's probably not a primary justification for legalising prostitution. It's that uh, if we decide to do it that will be an advantage of it. But it's probably not gonna form part of our actual decision of whether or not we're gonna do it or not. The things that we probably are gonna form the actual thing in that sense is, yeah, first of all, identifying is it necessary? Okay, you know, have we, have we identified a, a problem that, 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 that we, means we need to do something? Secondly, making it clear what is it you hope to achieve? Okay, by, by boycotting the Beijing Olympic Games, 
what actually are you, the proposition, hoping to achieve? By paying um, obese people to lose weight, what are you trying to achieve? Okay, are you trying to achieve, um, you know, every person in the United States um, being of a healthy weight? Okay, if you don't say what it is you're hoping to achieve, then you can be sure that the opposition are going to tell, decide for you, and then tell you that you're not going to achieve it. Okay, so make sure that you've identified what it is you want to achieve and why that's a necessary thing to achieve. Okay, or why it's a desirable thing to achieve in that sense. Is your plan going to be effective at achieving it? Okay, so again, Beijing Olympic Games say that what you, um, you know, wanted to achieve is you want to achieve better human rights in, in China. How is it that boycotting the Olympic Games is going to lead to that in that sense? Okay, is it justifiable? Because you can have a situation where you've got a need, you've identified a problem and a solution that solves that problem, but the opposition uh, are not going to attack it in that way. They're going to attack the fact that, um, that your solution is not a justifiable solution. And under that often comes things about the role of the government and whether or not the government is justified in acting in this particular case, or whether or not this is actually a case of, um, of individual choice. That's where you often get morality arguments, principled arguments, um, coming forward in, in that way. So something about the kind of, uh, you know, is it, is it justified in terms of morality and in terms of appropriateness of, um, of agency in that sense. And then this kind of last slide one, which is often what will kind of get uh, left to, to a second speech if you're doing it this way, what will the additional benefits be? What are the other ways in which it might lead to the world being a better place? So, Again, not every, not every debate will look like this. Certainly, I'm talking particularly about policy ones there. But even within policy debates, you have to be a little bit open and flexible. But I'm thinking it's not a bad thing to do when you've heard the motion and you've got your 15-minute prep to start by asking yourself those questions. Because if you miss out the answers to any of those, unless you've thought about it and decided why you can miss it out, then you run the risk of the opposition being able to stand up and say, but in the end, ladies and gentlemen, they never showed us a need. Or, but in the end, ladies and gentlemen, it's fine, we agree this solution will solve their problem, but we just don't think it's morally acceptable for this to happen in this way. So you need to have thought about those questions, because those are the things that you have to prove. And can you see that there's a different way of thinking between thinking, here is my list of reasons why I think something is a good idea, and on the other hand, I have a statement that I'm trying to prove, and here are the different steps that I need to go through in order to prove that statement right. And I think most VP debates spend six speeches with people just adding reasons. First two teams have their reasons, third speakers add another reason. And then often it's only the summary speaker who stands up and says, what do we have to have shown you to win this debate today? Well, we have to show you that it's necessary, we have to show you that it's a practical solution, and we have to show you it's morally justified. Okay, and at that point everyone goes, oh, I see the debate now, I see what you prove, I see how it all fits together. But I think my kind of thing about what you can most do to try and win the debate from the first proposition is to do that from the beginning. Okay, and to go through those steps and set up that case. So at the end of the debate, when they're still talking about is it necessary, is it morally justifiable, is it effective, those were your questions that you brought up from the start and established from the start. So clear definitions. That's your one advantage over everyone else. You get to decide um, and do that, um, that definition. So clear definitions. At least consider the big and bold option before you run straight for the centre ground. Make sure that you don't uh, leave out the principles and leave the principles for later down the table. They're big <coughs> arguments that stay in the debate. Labelling. Keep your ideas in the debate. Make sure that you identify as you're putting together your case what do you have to prove so that your arguments stay in the debate. The last thing is points of information. Okay, it, as Boyana said this morning, uh, points of information, offering points of information, being on your feet, crucial for every team, but most important for the first proposition team. If you've done your bit and the rest of the debate's going on and you're sitting there waiting for the end, then the judges are more likely to forget about you. So you need to be up on your feet, reminding them, even if you're not being taken, reminding them that you're the engaged um, team in this debate. If the debate has started to move away from your grounds, 
okay? If you've set up the debate on one kind of thing and you really feel that everyone's forgotten about that and now they're debating something kind of petty down at the bottom half of the table, your points of information should be designed to try and bring your arguments back into the debate. Okay, so if you think there's a big argument that you won and now no one's talking about it, try and force that speaker to address it in their points of information. To remind the judges, come on, we said this and this might have been forgotten, but it's still here. Because you don't want to rely on your proposition summary speaker, who's not in the end on your team, to big up your arguments in the summary speech. They might do. They might think that's strategically the right thing to do. Um, they might decide uh, if, you're, if they think you're a, they're, you're a threat to them, but they don't want to spend too much time um, talking about what you did right in the debate. So your best way of stopping yourself from getting shut out in that sense is, um, is to make sure that you try and get your own points and own point of information. If the debate has stayed on your terms, okay, and, and you're feeling pretty confident that it's not that you've been forgotten and your contribution has been forgotten, then your points of information can be much more direct, hit the arguments they're coming up with, try and hit a new opposition extension, um, to, to, you know, kind of follow the debate in that sense. But if you're worried that your contribution is getting lost, don't waste a point of information by hitting the new opposition extension. Use it to bring back and remind people of your own material in that way. Um, I think I said at the beginning, didn't I, Lexi, that I was going to talk a little bit about things you could do, sort of sneaky things you could do if you wanted to, to think about how you might increase your advantage over first opposition and um, second proposition. So I'll just talk about that really quickly before um, for, us, um, for any more questions. Um, and I should say that all of the stuff I've said so far, I think, is a better way of trying to win from first proposition. Trying to set the terms of the debate, stamp your presence on it, make sure everyone's debating within the criteria and the terms that you set out in the debate. I think that that's the, the best way in that sense. But there are ways, as I said, that you can try and wrong foot your first opposition and your second proposition in that way. In terms of the first opposition, um, in terms of um, what you can do to beat them, obviously, as I said before, the main way is that your second speaker just needs to hammer their first speaker as much as possible. There's going to be another three opposition speakers that you're never going to get a chance to respond to unless they choose to take you in a point of information. So that means when you have got that chance of hammering the first opposition speaker, you've really got to do it. Okay? You can't sort of let that, any of that opportunity go in that sense. Um, in terms of making it hard for them in that way, um, I think that sometimes, I need to be careful here, I want to kind of say that sometimes slightly taking them by surprise can be a, a, a way of taking an advantage. But that doesn't mean that I think you should run something weird. So I don't think running something weird is ever a way of, um, of winning from, from first proposition. You know, as I said, the debate should be um, kind of on the, the heart of the issue and on the key issue. I think sometimes, actually, being really bold can be a way of, um, of, of wrong-footing your opposition. Uh, if they might be thinking about, you know, they're trying to wrestle kind of the centre ground or something, and then you really come out with a very, you know, strongly libertarian case or something, um, and what they they have to do instead is um, come up with a very sort of moralistic first op, and perhaps they've been thinking that you were probably going to run something safer, and they've been thinking about all of the practical problems and the solution, and uh, you can kind of say, um, trying to think of an example. Um, so, for example, in the debate on organs, if your main reason for doing it is your libertarian argument, and your benefit is that it will create organs that are much needed, then if a first opposition team has spent lots of time thinking about um, how there are better ways to get organs, um, how it's might not actually lead to people getting organs, all of this stuff. So you can kind of say, look, even if it doesn't lead to that, we still stand by this because we still stand by the principle that the government shouldn't be involved in what I can and can't do with my body. So we still win, even if all of that's right. They have to show us why, um, why we can't have that control over, over our own body. And you still go ahead and support and argue for why your benefits are going to be there, but perhaps in that case, you might have um, uh, sort of run something that they weren't expecting you to go with that kind of anger in that way. So sometimes being bold um, can, can work well in that case. Um, sometimes, particularly um, on certain sorts of motions or at certain sort of competitions, thinking about it from a more international point of view um, than they might have considered might also be a way um, of taking some surprise ground. 
Okay, so thinking about um, if you've chosen to run a case internationally, thinking about arguments about how it might particularly affect developed countries um, or de uh, uh, versus developing, um, or um, dictatorships or theocracies, and you know, thinking about some of those issues can just could just be a way of um, taking away some of their ground from them that way. In terms of trying to take an advantage over the second proposition team. Um, well, I think that the idea of asking those questions of what do we actually have to prove to win the debate is a good start, um, because it stops the, op the proposition summary speaker from being able to be the first person to do that, or indeed the extension speaker to be able to be the one that stands up and says, ah, what this really comes down to, we've heard all these reasons, but what it really comes down to is, uh, you know, can it be justified in that sense, because you would have gone through those steps yourself. I think there can also be a sense, though, of... Um, so firstly, with, with second proposition team, making sure that you've covered all of the big arguments. All right, so in that case, if you have come up with arguments for need, effectiveness, um, moral justification, desirability, run them all. Because you don't want to be like the third speaker to be able to sort of say, well, they've talked about how there's a need and how this is morally justifiable, but what we're going to do now is talk about how it's effective. Because of course, ladies and gentlemen, if it's not effective, um, then nothing else um, will matter. So don't leave one of the steps of proof for them, because that's giving them too easy a job in that sense. But so you only want the possible, the only possible thing you want them to be able to have to extend to is like a minor add-on benefit that seems insignificant compared to the big arguments that you've managed to put in the debate about how how you prove in that sense. Uh, to make sure you kind of hit the, the big arguments in that sense. But in that second speech, when you're doing your um, all of the ways in which this is going to make the world a better place, when you're doing your additional benefits, when you are doing your stuff about how this is going to free up police time and um, help the economy and uh, improve international relations or the regional benefits and things, do try and cover quite a lot of ground within that. Okay. In the end, the more that you can cover, the harder it is for them to find a new area to move the debate on to the so as I say, it's the kind of, you have to make a judgment, firstly, it's not a good way of winning a debate, to be thinking in that sort of sense, and secondly, obviously, the more ground that you try and cover, the less depth of analysis you'll be putting in, and so potentially you could be harming yourself in that way. So there's always going to be a, um, a trading game to play, um, but don't make it too easy for them by leaving huge areas of the debate untouched for them to be able to, um, to take on, because they've got the advantages of speaking half an hour later. Don't leave them an advantage of, of a lot of material left to cover. Okay. Any questions? How to win from opening up? Yes. Okay, so uh, before you were talking about how instead of just dividing your speech by arguments, you should divide it by how it's necessary, how we hope to achieve it. So, firstly, um, like, can you explain like how we would go through a speech like that, and secondly, like how we would assign folks to that? Um, okay, so say um, uh, you're doing a, a debate with you this morning on paying these people. Um, you might want to say something like, you know, in my speech, first of all, um, I'm going to establish the extent of the obesity problem and why we have to do something about it. Um, secondly, um, I'm going to look at the fact that um, our action that we want to take will be an effective way of reducing um, obesity um, um, in America. And thirdly, I'm going to look at why it is the right thing for the government to get involved in this situation to act. My partner is going to go on to look at um, the additional benefits um, of um, how this will improve America's image abroad, it's an argument I had this morning, um, and um, how it will promote um, general um, health and economic efficiency in the country. Okay, so I'm proving it in my first speech, because remember you can't hang the case, you have to prove it in the first speech. By the end of the first speech, the next speaker can't be able to stand up and say, I agree with absolutely everything you say, and I still disagree with the motion. So you have to um, prove the whole case within the first speech, and then allow the second speaker to take on additional benefits that you want to add to the debate. Does that make sense? Yes. Although, as I say, ideally then, if you can put some good names and tags and linguistic things um, that are more exciting and memorable than that, then that's great. The clarity is more important than, um, than, than anything else. Any other questions? 
go. Well, I might see some of you doing an opening up this afternoon. Sorry, last question then. Um, you, uh, what's it called? We were talking about tags before, and I also noticed that whenever you speak, you use some alliteration as well. Um, do you think of uh, different types of alliteration and different tags in advance of uh, going into a preparation round? Like, do you have a bank that's I'm ready to go? Um, <laughs> Um, She's just that good. Yeah. I've never, I've never thought about doing that consciously. Um, but to be honest, perhaps just after X number of years of being in debates and watching debates, they are all filed away there somewhere, so um, you know where, um, where to get them in that sense. In terms of clear tags, I think some of those ones we were just talking about, some of those questions: is it necessary? Is it morally justifiable? Um, is it the role of the government? Those just are tags that are reused in um, key issues in a lot of debates. So you can sort of pick them out in that way. In terms of more interesting ones, in terms of um, things that use alliteration um, or imagery um, or, or rhetoric or humour, um, I think really that you have to come up with them as are appropriate for, um, for the debate. But uh, I bet you could do it because I bet you don't ever spend any time trying to do it because it's probably just not on your mental list of the things that you might be thinking about um, when, you're, when you're doing a debate speech. But if you kind of said to yourself, right, I'm going to give myself 40 seconds think about um, some, some language use, a more particular image or a, a joke I want to start my speech with or whatever it was, um, then, then I'm sure it would all be there. It's just about whether or not you choose to spend time on it and that's it. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much.